Welcome to Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. I'm your host, Damali Peterman. On this podcast, we introduce our new season's theme, resilience. And I, along with the guest co-host, will share how we remain resilient amidst the COVID-19 pandemic. We want to inspire our listeners to continue to break through. Welcome to the show. On today's episode, I am so delighted to present Kimberly Jenkins, Assistant Professor of Fashion Studies in the School of Fashion at Ryerson University. Kim, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, It is an honor to be here. Um, Thank you so much. Uh, You are my favorite. (laughs) <laughs> the feeling is mutual. I want everyone to know why you are my favorite. Oh. Kimberly lectured previously at Parsons School of Design and Pratt Institute. Kim designed an elective course and exhibition entitled Fashion and Race and has shared her insight at South by Southwest and Google headquarters. Her expertise on fashion history, race, and cultural awareness has led to academic advising and research work for Gucci, the Lions Modeling Agency, Tommy Hilfiger, Camera Nazionale della Moda Italiana, the Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and Instagram. Kim holds an MA in Fashion Studies from Parsons School of Design. And Kim has recently founded and launched a consultancy called Artist Solomon that works to educate the fashion industry. I look forward to our conversation focused on the theme of resilience as it relates to conflict and how you and your company and your industry navigated the last 18 months. The goal is to encourage and inspire our listeners to continue to break through. Kim, wow, we're going to have a comfy, informal, and free-flowing chat, and our listeners should feel as if they're eavesdropping on a private conversation between two friends. I always like to start with how I know our guest co-host. And I am so proud to say that Kim and I worked together um, for a while, actually, because I was her attorney, representing her and some of these amazing opportunities that she's mentioned. And so, Kim, I want people to know more about you, and I'd love to invite you to describe yourself in six words or less. Oh, gosh. Um, Educator. That's the first word that comes to mind. Um, community leader, um, uh, visionary, maybe it's a, in some aspects, um, ah, uh, gosh, those are really the organizer. I mean, that kind of goes with community leader, but yeah, a leader and an organizer. Um, those are the main words. They really kind of speak to the professional side of me, but I I think when it comes to kind of my personal life and professional life, it all is kind of inextricably linked with my desires and, and, and loves for organizing and, and nurturing people and starting conversations everywhere I go. Um, so those are some of the words I would use to describe myself. I, I love that educator, community leader, uh, organizer visionary. I would also add creative. Uh, oh, yeah. Definitely. Um, and I, I love hearing that these these all kind of speak to your needs of nurturing others um, and also just being a leader, right? So as a leader, these are some of the things that you do both in your professional um, and personal life. And so tell us more about that. I want to hear more about your business, um, your industry, and why are you in this field? How did you get here, Kim? Well, um, making a very long journey, a book worthy journey, um, short in this, uh, conversation, I, well, okay. So one thing I'd like to start by saying to our listeners is I truly believe that your journey, no matter how messy maybe, um, it can be, or, um, how it just kind of goes down all these meandering paths, Um, If you're really in tune with yourself and your journey, I mean, and I'm talking about ever since childhood, if you were thinking about the things that brought you joy, the the, um, maybe skills, talents, or gifts that you've had, um, some of the pivotal uh, experiences you had in your life along the way, um, even if it doesn't fully relate to the job you have or the profession you're in, all of it can be threaded, I believe, um, into the great story of your life and, and the work that you do. Everything sort of seems to come back. And for me, 
I always had a passion when I was little for communicating. I would see women on the news and say, I want to be a news reporter or a journalist. And um, when I was in school, I wanted to be in the teacher's shoes because I loved how they were kind of leading the discussion and educating us. Um, I would watch TV shows uh, that where you could learn like LeVar Burden reading Rainbow and where, you know, it was sort of this form of edutainment. I loved museums. I loved fashion. I loved watching fashion um, runway shows in the in the nineties growing up, and I was just fascinated by human beings too. Um, besides going to museums, I went on to study anthropology in undergrad, um, and so I thought, oh my gosh, how do you how do you take all of these very random experiences um, or different passions and kind of cobble them together into a life? And um, for the past twenty years of my life, it, it, I wasn't really sure. Uh, where that was going to go or how all that was going to kind of all those pieces were going to fall together. But in the last 10 years of my life, um, after I was holding a degree in cultural anthropology, which really just kind of studies human beings and why we behave the way we do and just kind of the, the whole study of human culture and minoring in art history because I love the arts and how um, humans create things to create meaning, um, but also keeping in the back of my mind that I still loved fashion I was worried that these were separate topics. I also growing up was interested um, in not just human development, but um, some of the social issues of our time as a teenager, um, world religions, the construct of race and racism, classism, you know, all these different things, how people develop elite societies and how these hierarchies develop. And again, I was wondering how on earth do all these different things that I love from religion and theology to fashion, you know, can these even go together? So again, going back to 10 years ago, when I ended up studying, I landed on cultural anthropology, studying art history. And then um, after getting my degree, um, the undergraduate degree, I wanted to work in a museum. And um, I was told immediately, oh, you're going to have to go to grad school. So I pursued grad school. I discovered a brand new program at Parsons School of Design in New York that uh, it was brand new and they were looking for new cohorts. Um, I applied and on the description on its website, it said this new kind of degree, master's degree is ideal for people who are interested in anthropology, art history, sociology, psychology. And, you know, it was just, I, it just, it was completely me. And I got into the program, got a scholarship. You know, I was, I ended up being one of the most enthusiastic students in the cohort. Um, I got an award after graduation for outstanding contribution um, to the program. I also had gotten an award back in undergrad in the anthropology program for outstanding contributions as a student in the program. And so um, in that, when I got that award, I'm not saying that just, you know, simply to like boast or anything. I got that award um, it, when I earned my master's degree in this new field called fashion studies, which essentially explores why we wear what we wear. Because while I was there, I always believed that whatever space you go in, you know, it's really important for me to build, you know, leave something behind, create something that, you know, leaves the space a little bit better than when you first found it. And so I created, um, I, I was hired as a student worker at the time as I was a student and um, like a program assistant. And I thought, well, I want to build a sense of community. So why don't I create a uh, newsletter? And so um, I developed a listserv for the program. And uh, now they ended up finding that listserv that I created that essentially gives everyone who follows it information on all the exhibitions that are happening in town, all the conversations that are happening in town, films, you know, anything that relates to this program. Doing that um, really helps support um, the program and um, kind of adding a sense of community. As I left, and that's why they gave me an award, um, I realized, you know, this an entrepreneurial spirit of kind of building a sense of community. And so I took that with me. Um, I was lucky enough to get a job teaching part time um, after I graduated. And the next seven years of my life, seven and a half years of my life, I was um, teaching. Um, I was a, a lecturer at Parsons School of Design and Pratt Institute. So then I was getting my feet wet and working with students. And I became that teacher that I dreamed of being when I was a, a kid and a teenager. And so um, building community in those spaces and educating. 
fast forward to uh, the most pivotal moment in my career, 2019. Now I'm about seven years into teaching. Um, and then I got to teach at pretty much the biggest level, which was um, I was uh, called upon by my school um, to meet with Gucci. Gucci happened to be um, going through an issue, <laughs> for lack of a better word, that required education. Um, and it was regarding race with a, um, a um, design that they had produced. And uh, making, again, that, that kind of extraordinary story short, it provided a new example, not just to the industry, but inside of my field, my academic field with what's possible. In that moment with them hiring me to be an educator, you know, I'm getting flown to Milan a couple of times, Hong Kong, I'll, you know, my life just changed in the, you know, the snap of a finger. And I was able to bridge being in the classroom space and then suddenly getting to be in the sort of boardroom space. And so um, it was a way to just kind of show that, you know, this education can be, this education work can be far reaching. And so um, from there, I also developed a um, website called Fashion and the Fashion and Race Project, which was a space for anyone else who was interested in the intersection or, or exploring fashion and race. Um, it provided all the resources you could ever need, the books, articles, talks, and things like that. And so once again, I was building community. Once again, I was creating spaces that didn't exist, um, resources um, that didn't exist. And that project is now called the Fashion Race Database or fashionandrace.org if anyone wants to visit the website. And I mean, it, it's it's incredibly robust now. It, it, um, I have now grown this humble little website into a website now that is supported by an entire team. And so I've got bookkeepers, I've got lawyers, I've got research assistants, um, a co content editor, a social media editor. I mean, we are just a full, a well-oiled machine now. And we are negotiating partnerships now with global brands. Like um, our brand partner this year is Tommy Hilfiger, who gets this work. They were so impressed with the website and the work that I was doing and being able to translate these kind of academic conversations over into the industry, and they found that relevance, that they are partnering with us now and they are commissioning research articles. Again, so this is just all to say, it's been a whirlwind now, my, my career. And it just goes to show that this work is important. And it just built a model now that even my colleagues or peers in academia never thought was possible. Before that, to anyone who's listening and doesn't really understand those spaces as much, you know, there's this, there's, for so long been just this bubble of academia where everyone just has academic conversations in their academic world and that's it. And then the industry does their industry stuff <laughs> in this world and that's it. So now I'm kind of building that bridge so that there's some sort of dialogue. That's an extraordinary story. And I love that your love and passion for things that, you know, that you said were dissimilar, right? But still like in the creative space from anthropology all the way to fashion and thinking about the reason that we wear what we wear um, and this and this underlying desire to always build community and to grow up to be you know one of those teachers or educators that you admire I love how you had the opportunity to do that um, you know that it's and that you won awards for your outstanding contribution both in undergrad also in grad school and I, I also love kind of hearing about the description of the new program for your master's uh, degree and how it just seemed to be written for you right mm -hmm. so someone who loves anthropology and sociology and fashion among other things and so it sounds like you've really taken um, advantage of these great opportunities that were presented to you it sounds like you went from you know graduating to going into education to um, working with some of the most wonderful minds with respect to you know fashion studies and also finding a way to show that intersectionality between many things, um, including in your fashion and race database, um, which as you mentioned has its own devoted and committed team, and this is something that is you know, to use one of the words you mentioned in the beginning, you know, it's part of, you are a visionary, that you saw something and started something that didn't exist. And now it's so robust that it has its own team tending to it with you spearheading 
the ship. I don't know if that's the right analogy, but we're going to go with it. You know, spearheading <laughs> the ship. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. But the point is that I, I love how you sort of arrived at this place where you are now. And given that you do sort of straddle a couple of different spheres from, you know, academia and, you know, as it relates to fashion, also being an entrepreneur, um, I'm curious to know, you know, today in 2021, what was your single biggest challenge, either in the industry or running your business um, throughout during the pandemic? Throughout the pandemic, um, the biggest challenge, and this has been um, kind of my theme now, I have like personal quarterly themes. Um, I have like this whole little kind of organizational board uh, where I map out my personal quarters of like my goals and, and objectives. And one thing that really came through for me in 2021 right now is, oh, wow, I need to work on boundaries. And that is all because of what happened in 2020. Um, and so during the pandemic, which is still ongoing, um, I one key you know, uh, thing they tell you in business, especially for entrepreneurs or even people who want to go into consulting uh, like I'm, I'm, I'm doing now, is do not say yes to you know, any and everyone who offers something and will give you money, you know, you need to really be intentional about the work you're doing. Does this meet my goals and objectives? You know, do I feel good about this? Do I want to be aligned with this person? Is, you know, do, you know, do these people get it? You know, is this someone I really want to work with? Um, how much time, you know, what's my capacity? And I did not have a, I, greatly overestimated my capacity and it ran me into the ground last year. I mean, we had a pandemic starting, a racial reckoning happening last summer, and especially in the summer of 2020, I was pulled at by everyone you can imagine because I was really standing at the front lines among others because I had race in my name, you know, and anyone with race, diversity, inclusion, uh, any professional black women who were just out at the forefront, we were pulled in every direction. And if you do not have a clear understanding of your capacity, your boundaries, being intentional just about how you use and, and give up your time, you know, um, you will be just completely left burnt out. And so that is where I landed. And even once again, this year, after promising, I'm not going to land in the same position. So one of the biggest challenges for me has been the power of no. I, don't, I know a lot of people have said the power of yes, but I would also argue for the power of no and um, really understanding what your boundaries are. And I'm still working through that because also there's an abundance of just so many amazing people who reach out via email saying, I would love to partner with you or our work is so similar. Why don't we do this together? Or some brand comes in saying, can we do this? And, you know, um, so, so really the biggest challenge has been finding the boundaries and what other challenge that came through and all this now that I have a full year reflection going with this work, um, is to, you know, this kind of goes with being intentional, is not to be too trusting or get too excited with everything people say. One thing that one major lesson I got last year was there are so many people who get excited about something and reach out to you and make all these promises and, you know, want to work together and it falls flat. I can't tell you how many industry leaders or, or brands reached out to me um, who were just kind of anxious and excited or just feeling incredibly guilty about the racial reckoning. And so then they were wanting to do these really kind of over the top projects with me and, and wanting to hire me for this, that, you know, and so, um, and they all fell flat, you know, they just disappeared. And then when you circle back to them, you know, they're just kind of gone. And so that is again, kind of tying into honoring and protecting your time and, you know, really having, that understanding about how, how your work is used and where you want to put your time and energy. So that was a big challenge. So right now, and especially going into 2022, I want to be intentional and set up those boundaries for this work. I'm so happy to hear you say that because I feel like it's something that our listeners need to hear. And I want to pause to make sure that it's really resonating because resonating with them as much as it's resonating with me, because boundaries are something that we all need to build and and build as high as we can. And I love that you said the power of no. Um, I recently attended a conference in DC and Ayana Van Zandt said there are many ways to say no. And she went through a whole litany from, you know, the 
yeah, I understand what you're saying, but the answer is no or nope. You're like, you know, just essentially <laughs> saying, get comfortable saying no, because to your point, I think those two things are connected boundaries and saying no. Saying no helps you preserve what you care about, helps you prioritize, it helps you to sort of think about how your time is being allocated. And I love that you tie that to opportunities and how. You know, some people may be well intentioned and excited, but unfortunately, the attention span may not be as as long as you want it to be, right? And so, I love hearing you tie those three things together because for people who are listening right now, just thinking about how much how you evaluate opportunities, how much time you devote to them, whether you know, looking back, you should have said no, and then how can you going forward be intentional? I love that word, Kim, about your boundary setting. So that you're, you know, sort of putting, making sure that you have the right amount of time devoted to the things that you are invested in and yourself, right? Because I think you also said it's a part of self-care, right? And I think that's something that we all have to focus on because Kim, like that Elton John song, you are still standing. (laughs) And so you're resilient. So where does your resilience come from and how do you tap into it? Well, um, I guess, again, going back, um, you know, and it, it's kind of a more somber point. Um, I lost my mom when I was 14 to breast cancer. She had breast cancer twice. And so um, uh, growing up, you know, turning 14 and then having to enter my teenage years at the most critical point, you know, to lose a mother, Um, you know, you're going through puberty, you're going into, you know, just so many different life changes, going into high school and just trying to, and especially just trying to grow up as a young woman and understand what womanhood looks like, you know, not having that person to model that for you. That definitely will bring in a sense of, okay, what are we going to do now? How, you know, you can either collapse in a puddle and just feel like life can't go on or, you know, we're going to power through this somehow, you know, and it's been a mixture of family's prayers, my dad's strength. Um, my dad is incredibly resilient, um, raising me really just, I had no choice, but to have faith in myself. I was all I had. And so, and my dad can only go so far. So navigating life through my teenage years as a young black woman, figuring it out, Um, And then going into college and, you know, just figuring out this whole life for myself and pursuing my passions. Resilience was learned. It's a, it's a tool uh, that is, it's an ongoing practice. It's, it's a muscle that is rather than a tool. It's a muscle that has to be kind of strengthened over time. And um, it only really gets a good workout through adversity, you know, and just, and, and kind of experiencing, you know, it could be trauma or it could be, you know, just challenges, day-to-day challenges and how you decide to react to those things. Um, For me, it was, you know, some of the most traumatic moment of my life. And then it's, you know, everyday disappointments, you know, things that just don't go the way you expected. Um, All of that works uh, together in tandem to have me wake up another day and realize, okay, I made it through that and I'm still standing. What's next? You know, how, you know, and you learn, you kind of teach yourself, oh, wow, I made it through that. Oh, wow, I could, I'm still standing from that. Um, And that gives you that courage um, and confidence to keep moving forward each day. Um, So, so yeah, it was a lot of that. And, And also just kind of the affirmations of me. Um, stepping out and taking risks, um, especially career-wise, the work I do, sometimes it, it can be a tremendous risk. I'm, I'm walk, I decided to pursue a career and build a career for myself without a net, really, you know, and just figuring it out and carving out a path myself. And, you know, for every no that I got along the way, I had a, a, a bunch of emphatic yeses and people saying, your work has, you know, helped me decide what I want to do in school now, or, you know, your work you know, is just really changing the game and fashion and, you know, creating spaces we didn't know existed, creating models we'd never even thought about. So it's also those things that give me that tremendous boost of resilience of, okay, I think I'm doing something right and I'm going to keep doing it. What, what, what else it. is next? I love it. And I also love that you said that, you know, it comes from family, it comes from faith. You said it can be learned and it's something mm-hmm. that's tested through adversity. And I think that's really encouraging Um, To anyone listening in, especially if you're trying to figure out how to tap into your source of resilience, that you can learn it 
And you can also revel in the fact that each day you wake up and you are still standing. And that's something in and of itself. Were there any mistakes that you made that you want to prevent others from making? Yeah, that goes back to the intentionality and um, boundaries. It That, again, is another ongoing practice. You know, sometimes I I do a little weekly review with myself. Um, I have a personal journal where, I, you know, what, what brought me joy? What can, you know, what lessons did I learn this week? What could I do better? What were some of the disappointments? And as I do that, I realize, you know what? Okay, it's another week with working on boundaries. You know, I <laughs> let some people trample over my boundaries. I, I said, you know, I was working with my assistant and saying, we're not going to take on any more interviews or meetings or this or this, this. And then I just kind of let it in because I'm, you know, I, I also have this nurturing aspect where I just think, oh, I can't turn someone away or if it's a student or if it's, you know, someone who wants help with this. Um, but um, I, I think it's just sort of um, working on that is, a, is an ongoing um, journey. And so, um, yeah. And so, and now navigating entrepreneurship and now that I've gotten all in and there's people also emotionally and invested and, you know, it, it physically invested, the people who are working on my team, you know, I keep building and building and climbing and climbing. And then you kind of look down and it can be a little terrifying. And now you've got other people climbing, you know, taking that ascent with you. And so um, I think some of the biggest challenges right now is exploring entrepreneurship because I came into this as a dreamer, as a creative and academic you know, um, not a, you know, a business major. So, um, so I'm working through that and looking for that support, which is critical. So it's having, also having to put my business hat on, look for funding, look for, you know, mentors, you know, and it, 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 I'm already on the right track, you know, meeting people like you has been just a game changer and, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's a work in progress, but I'm hopeful. It's a work in progress, but it's also something that you have just been on this tremendous path. You know, kind of what I love about what I've heard you say over the course of this podcast and just from knowing you is that it's almost like, you know, the road, like you're building the road, you're building this road, this path as you're walking on it. Kind of like think of like the yellow brick road mm -hmm. and you're putting down those bricks and then others are coming behind you. And that to me, you know, it add a, another word to you. Uh, the description of you, your trailblazer, Kim. And I just love seeing it as you chart your path and as you launch your company and as you continue to show, you know, this the, you know, using your consultancy practice to educate others about fashion and many aspects of fashion. Um, but specifically, you know, some of the things that you've done over the last few years have been and continue to be game changers and in the way that people think about fashion and race and think about where you know, I know some of the work that you've done about focusing on like why we do certain things or where certain fashion styles came from. I was able to hear you speak a few times talking about some of these things and it's just fascinating. So I definitely encourage everyone to check out the, the fashion and race database to learn more about you. And given that you are an educator, we know you have a nurturing spirit and that you like really foster and build a sense of community everywhere that you go and in everything that you do. I want to end with um, this statement that my mom used to always make. And I don't think it's original to her, but she used to always say to us growing up, each one teach one. So I'd love for you to suggest a book a song a course for a program for our listeners. And I want others just to know I am pushing the fashion and race database. So that's already out okay. there. So something different than that. Okay. Um, gosh, in terms of a favorite, I am, I'm a constant learner and I, I'm also, so when you become a, get in a leadership space or, you know, even if you are like kind of envisioning things that don't exist, um, the work that that requires, and just kind of briefly speaking, um, I, I sacrifice a lot of time having fun with people and, you know, cause I'm always keeping my head down and building things and I'm surrounding myself. Like if you come into my apartment any given morning, there's like half a dozen podcasts that I'm plowing through because I constantly want to keep hearing voices that are, um, inspiring me or encouraging me to keep going, you know, people I admire. So, um, it's, it's kind of a, um, a, a medley of things. So lately, um, I listened to Cal Newport's podcast, um, Deep Work, 
or I think it's called like the deep podcast. And it's based off of um, his groundbreaking work in um, deep work. He has a book called deep work and it's um, among other books, but he's all about kind of doing focused, intentional work. Um, so I listen to his podcast to keep hearing his voice in my ears all week long. That reminds me to stay the course and stay deep and stay intentional. Um, I just finished a book um, by Lori Rudiman called Book Betting on Yourself. So any listeners who are also thinking about a career pivot um, or just some sort of life pivot or a pivot within their own workspace, um, I highly recommend Betting on Betting on You by uh, Lori Rudiman. So she kind of gives you all the strategies it takes to kind of build um, a career that you really love. And then in terms of um, understanding who you are and branding and kind of a fashion shout out, um, I recommend following Elaine Welteroff, um, former editor-in-chief of Teen Vogue. She's someone who else who blazed a trail, leaving magazine publishing and then just realizing, okay, what are my skills and strengths? I am a motivational, you know, inspiring speaker. So she took that got an agent agency and left New York for California. And now she's on, I think the talk as a host, she's co-hosting project runway. And she just created, she just, she just joined master classes um, that, that series master classes about branding yourself. So following, you know, these people who are kind of guiding you along the way and even seeing models like uh, models for um, understanding who you are and what is possible for yourself, like Elaine Welteroff. Um, yeah, the list is ever evolving. And those are some really excellent suggestions. I really want to thank you so much, Kimberly, for joining thank us you. today. Wow, what an incredible, I can listen to you talk all day. I would <laughs> love to be one of your students, just listening to your lectures, just soaking in all of that brilliance and also just being encouraged about all the things that you're doing right now to leave the world in a better place than you found it, to be frank. Mm -hmm. um, and so I really appreciate our audience for tuning in today. I'm your host, Damali Peterman, and this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day. Please follow us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn at Breakthrough ADR. That's the at sign, B-R-E-A-K-T-H-R-O-U-G-H, capital A, capital D, capital R. I'm your host, Damali Peterman. And this is Breakthrough Barriers with Damali. Although I am a lawyer, mediator, and an educator, and many of my co-hosts will represent various professions, we want to be clear that we are not providing legal advice, counseling, or suggestions. Our goal is to provide a roadmap for conflict resolution to generate future conflict resolvers. Continue to break through and have a wonderful day.